But for well, first thing, it would just be like a self intro, your name and, and what you're doing. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm Bindi Allen and I'm a wildlife warrior. I live here at Australia Zoo and my goal in life is to bring the message of wildlife and conservation to as many people as I possibly can. I've dedicated to my life my life to protecting yeah. animals and following my dad's footsteps. Awesome. All right, Bindi, the first question, straight off the bat, why do you think population is the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about? Why don't people want to talk about it? Population seems to be the elephant in the room that everyone avoids for a lot of reasons. I think that population is such a big issue facing our world today that a lot of people believe that if they can just ignore it, it's out of sight, out of mind. Maybe it'll disappear. Also, for reasons such as political reasons, religious reasons, people don't want to be shot down for talking about population. They're afraid because it is such a challenging topic that over the years we've kind of this developed this idea that we never have to worry about controlling our numbers. We never have to worry about how many people we have. This is the way we've always lived. And so that's the problem, is that we don't want to talk about population because of those reasons. And I think that the only way we can help to create positive change is just to start discussing it. Because, you know, people, it's all well and good to think, well, one day someone will solve the problem. Yeah. But that one day has to come soon, otherwise our whole world will collapse. Yeah. So it's really important that we start talking about this issue. And there's no one, one solution no, either. Right. So I think that it's something that we all need to discuss and start thinking about ways to tackle the issue. Not just add one thing, what was it that brought you to this topic of overpopulation? For me, uh, I never really realised how much overhuman population affected everything in our world. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a, a great advocate for wildlife and conservation and teaching people about you know, loving animals and getting involved, getting outside, making a difference. And recently I started working with Dick Smith. Mm -hmm. And Dick Smith is an amazing entrepreneur mm -hmm and just an all-round incredible man. Yeah. And he approached me and asked if I would like to be involved with launching his book. And his book was all about population. Mm. It's population crisis. Mm. And he's been really involved in this issue. Yeah. So he came and asked me if I'd like to help. And of course, I jumped at the chance and said, yes, I'd love to, but first I'll have to read your book yeah. before I can help yeah. you. So I sat down and I read his book. And after reading it, I was surprised to see that everything, all the problems on our planet, all seem to stem from one issue, yeah. population, including global warming. Mm. It all stems from this one problem. Yeah. And so I came to realize that all of my messaging about wildlife and protecting our Earth, the biggest problem was right in front of me, and I'd never thought about it before. So I, I helped him launch his book, and from that moment on, I just decided to dedicate my life yeah. to bringing this issue to light, to start getting people to talking about this sure. issue. Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Yeah, we're hoping to um, get an interview with Dick as well. Oh, that's great. You'll yeah. have, he's an amazing man. Yeah, he was away at the time when I approached his secretary, but I'm just waiting to hear back. So hopefully yeah, he's, he's funny. He's always travelling, though. Yeah. That's, that's what's incredible about Dick yeah. Smith, is he knows more about Australians, Australia and Australians than... Anyone else I know, he's travelled the world and he's an incredible person and is actually actively doing things. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't talk about it, he doesn't say, well, one day I will. He actually does things right now. Yeah, it sounds like he's used his wealth for the greater good, like you know, putting it back into He has, into and he hasn't been afraid to speak his mind and to stand up for what he believes in. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, we should all take a page out of his book. Mm. That's a very admirable trait, mm. to stand up for what you believe in, no matter what anyone else mm. says. Yeah. And that's why I was so inspired. Because for me, as a kid, it would be all well and good to say, oh, that's a big, it's a big issue, population is huge, I'm yeah. going to avoid yeah. it. But I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Why not talk the walk? Just sure. try it out, yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, can you tell us the story of your friend Ruth and the phenomenal population growth and changes that happened? happened in a lifetime. Yeah. Ruth Rath was one of my best friends and she was an amazing woman. I love to go and visit her. She lived in Oregon, my mum's hometown, but she was an unusual friend mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was an unusual friend because she passed away a couple years ago at the age of 104 and 
I would go and visit her and I'd sit down and just listen to her tell stories. She'd tell me the most amazing stories about growing up when she was a little girl. Yeah. When she was a little girl, there was no such thing as sliced bread. There was no such thing as zippers. She, she never saw a car until she was 10 years old. Yeah. There was no such thing as plastic. Can you believe that? The amount of plastic yeah. we use every day. Yeah. There was no plastic. Uh, but I think the most amazing thing about Ruth was that when she was born, there were 1.5 billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now she passed away a couple years ago at the age of 104. And when she passed away, there were 6.7 billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. In one woman's lifetime, the population increased from 1.5 to 6.7 billion people. And that's really scary. One, one woman experienced that amount of change. Imagine if that happens in my lifetime. Yeah. The population didn't double. It expanded phenomenally, which is really scary for someone like me as a child myself. I think uh, Professor Roger Short. Just adjust the mic. Yes, it's fine. But I'll just try to get. Just rubbing a little bit. Have you got a water? Yeah, you're up with. Oh, thank you. At that conference, Professor Roger Short, he was getting up, he spoke about Paul Ehrlich. The population bombing, he said it's, it's exploded. It's exploded, yeah. literally. Yeah. Like, the, there's no other way to explain it hmm. other okay. than it is, it is an explosion of people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of... I find it funny when people talk about controlling other animal species. Because as humans, yeah. we do that. Yeah. You know, we'll talk about controlling the... Do, like wild dog populations yeah. or we, we want to control the amount of kangaroos in Australia yeah. but we can't even consider the amount of people in our own species I mean and it's not so much as controlling our population it's just thinking about it and giving people the option so giving women the choice of family planning yeah. so it's it's a topic that's really unpopular but it's it's funny how people always jump at the chance to say that there's too many all of these other animals. Sure. But we'll never say that about yeah, our, right. our own species. Okay, next question. Uh, the potent energy of fossil fuels are combined with our technology to harness and utilise its power is what has allowed, really, ultimately, this, the human population to expand so much. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think, have we fallen into the trap of living beyond our means in the sense that are we artificially sustaining this massive population with one use only fossil fuel? Well, ever since the Industrial Age, since the advances in fossil fuels and their uses, uh, our population has seemed to explode. I mean, we've had so many more people on the planet. I like to give this analogy just, just to help people put this in perspective. Because when you talk about there's 7 billion people on the planet, that's a big number. And when I talk to my peers or just even other some adults, and I talk about these numbers, it kind of it kind of tends to go over your head mm -hmm. because they're such large numbers. So let's say for a minute that I'm going to have a party. Mm -hmm. I'm having this party and I'm inviting 15 of my closest friends. I have 15 sandwiches. Mm -hmm. My room is big enough to fit 15 people. I've got 15 party bags, one for each of my friend. And I'm ready for my party. So I hear a knock at the door and I realize that my friends have arrived. Only when I open the door, 70 people are standing there wanting to come to my party. What do I do? My room is only big enough to fit 15 people. How will any of my friends have room to dance if there's 70 in the room? What about the sandwiches? Do I divide the sandwiches among the 70 people? But then my friends will still be hungry because they've only had that much sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. How about the party bags? Do I only give the party bags to my favourite friends? That's unfair to all of the yeah. other guests. Yeah. That is the problem facing Mother Earth today. Mm -hmm. She invited 1.5 billion people to the party and 7 billion showed up, mm -hmm. which is scary. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. A climate skeptics claim that environmentalists like ourselves trying to stop the exporting of coal are starving poorer nations from having the lifestyle that we enjoy. But isn't it an illusion to think that everyone on the planet can have their standard of living raised to be middle class consumer consumers 
but it would take four Earths full of resources if everyone lived like the way we do uh, in Australia or the USA. Yeah, well, I think that it would be really challenging to get people to all live off of a bowl of rice, for example. For us, as a society, we always want the best for our families. That's just the truth. I mean, I'm sure as parents, they want the best for their kids. They want to give them a great lifestyle, which is really, really important. And so I think that the issue really comes down to population. Because with all of our people, we will eventually be warring over food mm. and water. Yeah. So that's what we should be thinking about, yeah. is our population and, and how many people we have on the planet. Mm. And, you know, we've got to start thinking, if, if we don't make changes to our lifestyles, of course that's, that's going to be a bad thing. So if we continue to drive our car every day to work, as well as, you know, turn our heating up so high and never recycle and... You know, th these are problems facing yeah. our earth. So we absolutely have to think about the little things, mm. but then also start uh, thinking about population and family planning. You know, there's so many women out there who don't get the choice. They don't get to choose how many kids they have. Mm -hmm. These are women in third world countries who it's forced upon them. Mm. And it's proven that when a woman has a better education, yeah. she has fewer children. Yeah. So perhaps it's an idea of educating women and giving them this freedom of choice yeah. uh, to, to have as many kids as they want. Yeah. I'm not saying that having a big family is bad, because it's not. That's your choice. Yeah. But, but we need to give them, give them these options. Mm. Because, you know, there's even young girls out there who are younger than me mm. having babies. Mm. And that's not normal. Mm. That's, that's yeah. not natural. And so I think this is the problem we, we should be thinking yeah. about. So I think you know, the Pope is against contraception and things like that, I guess. So mm. your religious culture. Yeah, yeah. Your, your religious aspects come through to it. And I think that it's religion is a very, very important part of our life. And, and everybody has their chosen beliefs. And that's wonderful. We should follow our beliefs and follow. If, if it's making you a good person yeah. and it's doing good for those around you, go for it. Mm -hmm. That's fine, yeah. but it's it's not forcing each other to do things. So it's if a, if a young girl doesn't want to have ten kids, then she should have that option. She should have the option of not having to have kids. Yeah. You know, I think that what's amazing, uh, one solution might be for young young girls. Say if you're an eleven year old girl and um, you, you don't want to have kids yet, there's actually an implant, um, and it's a seven year implant. And I think that it goes into your wrist area. Mm -hmm. And that stops you from, ha from having kids yeah. for seven years. Yeah. And so that at least buys them time until they're 18 years old. Yeah. So perhaps that's an idea. Sure. So it's thinking about, because there's no one, one solution, but it's thinking about all these different ways that we can start making impact and making a change. Mm -hmm. Because it's all well and good to talk about it, yeah. but we need to start taking yeah. some action. Sure. And yeah, yeah, start changing our ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, all good, thank you. That leads into the next question. How do we reduce population without it being seen as totalitarian? And then, how do we deal with the ageing population that would, would ensue? Because though raising living standards, as we are talking about earlier, in third world countries is a proven way to reduce birth, uh, birth rates, do we need to be careful then that we're not creating more, you know, bringing and raising people's lifestyles up and creating more consumers, which negates any sort of gains that we make? With, with the Asian population, there is a debate going around that if we don't have more young people, they won't be able to care for our aging members of society. This is a trap that we're going to fall into. So if we have more kids to take care of our elderly, then when these kids get old, we're going to need more kids to take care of this. It's just an ongoing problem. Exactly. It's going around and around in circles until we build ourselves into this whole. We, we can't get out. And we need to start thinking about that. If you think about our aging population, I mean, these young people are consuming so much of our, our resources on planet Earth mm -hmm. that occasionally our older people are ignored anyway. Yeah. So we need to start rethinking those ideas. And also, I find it fascinating because it's fine to say that we need more people, more people, mm -hmm. more people. What's the problem? 
Okay, well there has to be a cutoff point. At some point, there's too many people on Earth. So right now we talk about traffic jams. We talk about um, too many people when I go to the supermarket. Yeah. Sure, but what's the cutoff point? So on planet Earth, do we stop at 7 billion? Do we stop at 14 billion? How about 40 billion people? When it gets to 40 billion people, do you think that might be the cutoff point? Yeah, no. At some point, even if you believe in a big population, eventually you're going to have to realize there's too many people. The planet can only fit so many people. The planet can only fit so many people. So we just have to, have to start rethinking our lifestyles. And what about the, the worry that people would see it as being a totalitarian thing where you're trying to control um, people's earth and the kids they can have and things like that? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's a matter of control. I, I don't think we should say to people, you are only allowed to have this many children or you're not allowed to have kids. That's probably not an option. I mean, I want people to have an option. Mm -hmm. So to be able to say, I'll have two kids or one kid instead of having to be made to have ten children. So I think it's all about giving people options. And um, that's certainly something we need to start thinking about for future. I mean, maybe towards the future we'll come up with a better plan. But right here, right now, mm -hmm. coming from a 15-year-old girl, watching other 12-year-old little girls have kids, that's not good. They yeah. don't want that. Yeah. They're children pushing prams, which is really scary. Yeah. So giving women the right and the option to choose, that's what that's my stand. Yeah, comparing women. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, Professor Roger Short, uh, we interviewed, he spoke about that same thing as well. Mm -hmm. It's true. I think it's also kid empowerment. As a child myself, I'm a strong believer in kid empowerment. As kids, we're the next voters, we're the next decision makers, and the next generation to be making a difference on our planet. So it's encouraging kids to stand up and kids to speak their mind for what they believe in. Because we're the next generation to be dealing with this. We have the ability to take a stand. I remember a few years ago, um, Mum and I sat down to watch a movie together. And it was a really old movie. <laughs> it was still in black and white. Yeah, it was that old. Yeah. Um, and so we, we sat down to watch it. And one of the actors said something that I thought was so haunting. He said that children should be seen and not heard. Oh, yeah, that old one. That old one. <laughs> and I had to ask my mum what that meant. Because in this day and age, I've never heard of that. And she told me that back then kids didn't get to have an option or yeah. a choice, which I thought was really sad. And so today, as kids, we are in this extremely unique opportunity where we're able to stand up for what we believe in and stand up for what we know is right. So we shouldn't just give away that opportunity, yeah. let it pass us by. We should act on it. Totally. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, scientists call our time uh, the Anthropocene because of the massive influence humans have on the landscape. Uh, working so intimately with wildlife as you do, is it personally painful for you to watch species struggle on the, the brink of extinction or indeed uh, become extinct because of uh, habitat loss, so uh, human activity, yeah. uh, human sort of creating this sixth mass extinction? It's really sad for me to watch so many species being destroyed mm. by human activity. I live in a zoo <laughs> and I'm very lucky for that and I'm surrounded by beautiful animals, wombats, koalas, tigers, rhinos, these animals that are being killed in the wild because of human activity. And I, I find that really quite devastating. They say that we are going through this sixth mass extinction, only it's a thousand times greater than previous extinction rates, including when the dinosaurs were wiped out. I mean, you think about previous extinctions. I mean, they were caused by volcanic eruptions, all sorts of different yeah. Earth-related problems. What's happening today? There are no meteorites hitting our planet. No volcanoes are erupting. Mm. I can only assume that this is caused by us, by people, and we are having that direct effect on the planet. Mm. Every time we lose an animal species, it's like losing a brick from the house. Pretty soon the house just falls down. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. That's how it's always worked mm -hmm. 
for eons. Mm. <laughs> that's the way our Earth has been set up. And so that's why it scares me so much. Mm. I, I want to make sure that my children and my grandchildren live in a world with clean air, mm. fresh drinking water, and an abundance of wildlife. Mm. That's, that's what I want. And so I won't stop until that becomes a reality. So I ch have chosen to dedicate my life to these issues, to planet Earth, so that I can hopefully make a change mm. and make it better mm. for my kids and my grandkids, because mm. that's what I want. Yeah. One of the um, things we also realize during one of the um, medical professors is that the more habitat we destroy, the plant species and all that, we could be destroying cures mm -hmm. that are bound often in plants and natural things to help people. We could lose that forever because we've destroyed forests. And completely, completely. If we mine the Great Barrier Reef, can you imagine the effects that's going to have on the planet? Mm. We, it seems like we have this little string and, and if we break the string, everything else collapses. There's only so much we can do. You know, um, talking to other scientists as well, as we continue to chop down these vast areas of, of rainforest, mm. eventually it'll get to a point where there's so few rainforests left that it just collapses. Yeah. Because it, it can't it can't survive. They they need that that's it's been done for a reason. Yeah. That's the design yeah. is to have this massive rainforest. So yeah. it'll collapse. Our fresh air, I mean my goodness. Our, our trees, our reefs, you know, that's, it's so important. Mm. We have these ecosystems. Mm. And then for fresh water, I mean, if you think about all the water on the planet, on the planet, it would fill, uh, so let's, let's think about this. Yeah. It, if we thought about all the water on the planet, um, it could fill a 44 gallon drum, let's yeah. say. So the 44 gallon drum is all of that, all of the water on the earth. And then the amount of fresh water would fill a bucket and the amount of accessible drinking water yeah. would fill a teaspoon. So, that there's a very mm. finite amount, mm. and there's seven billion people. Mm. Do you think maybe we're gonna be warring over this, yeah. these resources one day? Yeah. If we're not careful. Yeah. One of the science professors was talking about with India and Pakistan, over Kashmir, mm -hmm. and because of climate change, the glaciers are melting. One of these glaciers feeds a river that feeds hundreds of millions of people through India and Pakistan and, and as that dries up there's going to be a war over the border that mm -hmm. resource to help feed and uh, was, you know, between India and Pakistan so yeah, yeah. isn't it scary but yeah, it's yeah, affecting totally. everybody yeah. and it's, it's unbelievable and you know there's already plans in place it, all of these little island regions as the ocean is rising yeah. eventually these island regions are going to be completely gone yeah. Go gone. Yeah. And so there's already plans in place for where we're going to put the people on these islands. Sure. It's a reality. Mm. We can't keep ignoring it. You know, th there's a certain point that you can say, out of sight, out of mind, but then you've got to go, well, this is, this is a reality. This yeah. is actually happening today. Mm -hmm. I can see it. I have to act on it. But if we wait until that point when it's blatantly obvious, yeah. it'll be too late. Yeah. So it, you can you can already start to see, you know, as as a young person, I watch. If you turn on the news in the morning, you'll see nine times out of ten there will be a record-breaking something, yeah. a record-breaking hurricane, record-breaking rains, record-breaking heat wave. You know that information's anecdotal, but that 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 so, it seems to be something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> There's something wrong with that. Yeah. You know, we haven't seen this much rain in a hundred years yeah. or on record. The earliest bushfires. The earliest bushfires. And it yeah. just keeps happen yeah. happening. Yeah. The earliest wet season in Cape York, starting in November. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, really scary. Mm. And so just for us observing things, observing things you, you've got to go, well, there seems to be this trend of badness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to start talking yeah. about these issues. And just like you said, they're, they're preparing for it. Because on the way up here, we stopped in Newcastle yeah. to film a new coal terminal mm -hmm. uh, to ship out our coal. And they had raised the land. Well, we were told it was two metres. We were there, it was about four metres. They actually raised the land several metres higher yeah. to allow for sea level rises coming from the very thing that they're selling. So it was like, 
we wrote this from our a coal executive we interviewed who's not a skeptic and was mm -hmm. like wow are you serious so on the way up here we filmed it and it was yeah they're, 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 so it's just bizarre like they know it's happening they're preparing for it so they keep selling the same the stuff that's causing it exactly exactly and so it's just it's changing our ways in the best mm. way we can and you know it's it's a big problem and i think that for people just living every day it's such a big problem that if we can say that it's not there and block it out it's easier on us because yeah. you feel like one person I know sometimes I'll wake up in, in the morning and go, the world's caving in, what am I going to do? I'm only one girl. And it's, that's understandable. But then I have to think to myself, well, I, I am one girl, I am one person, and I can make a difference. I can change my lifestyle and hopefully empower those around me to change their lifestyle. Yeah. And then we've got positive change. Yeah. So if I can talk to my neighbour, <laughs> And the girl who lives in town about changing their ways and recycling and mm -hmm. start talking about these, these issues, then I've made a difference. Yeah. And one person can change the world forever. You know, my dad was one man yeah. who changed the world. Yeah. If one man can make a difference, you can make a difference too. Yeah. And it's just telling people yeah, that. Yeah. You, you, you can make it, whether you live in Hong Kong, in, in a high rise apartment, we're in the middle of the Aussie outback. <laughs> you can change your lifestyle yeah. and affect those around you. That's what we're happy to do. Yes, absolutely. Oh, airplane. <laughs> we'll wait for that. We're right to get going. Yeah, yeah, we're right. We're, we're still rolling. Right. We're still rolling. Right. Next question. Uh, the media often present climate change debates with a 50-50 ratio of believers and skeptics, when the science, based on facts, not opinions, is more like um, 97 to 3. Do you think this media bias towards trying to appear even, even when the facts are tipped so far in the favour of the science, is one of the reasons that's caused so much um, climate scepticism and confusion amongst the, the general populace? Sure. I think that uh, with media, that's our source of information. Mm. That is where we get all of our information from. So it is something where you, you listen to the media and, and you're trying to always evaluate things for yourself. but. As a society, we, we want to think that everything's fine and, and going to be okay. And so I suppose that it's a double-edged sword. So it's really lovely that the media is there and telling people that it's okay, you know, you can be, you can be skeptical. But then you've got that science that says, it's not okay, <laughs> this is really bad. And so if we're all happy and loving life, we're not going to realise the problems actually facing our world. Mm -hmm. So what I try and do is turn things into a positive. Mm -hmm. Because often when you get bogged down in this issue, yeah. you can start to feel really sad and depressed. Because this is a giant problem, we need a giant solution right now. Mm -hmm. And instead of being doom and gloom, um, for me, we do some um, media work, we do filming work, documentaries, movies, things like that. And so when I bring up this issue, I try so hard to make it a positive. If there is something that you can do. You can change your world. You can make a difference. And kind of, I'll approach the, the issue of population, but then give people easy solutions as well, which is talking about the problem with other people that you know, recycling, <laughs> planting a tree, doing things in your own backyard. Mm. That, that can help the planet yeah. because then it doesn't seem so challenging and giant. Mm. It doesn't seem like such a hard problem that we'll never get through. Yeah. So we all put in a little bit. A little together. bit. Together we can make a huge difference. Yeah. So as a kid, that's what I try and tell people is that it's not all doom and gloom. There can be a positive. There is a light at the end of the yeah. tunnel. And that way we're not ignoring the facts, but we're also not really really sad about what's going to happen to our planet yeah. yeah so i think if we can find that happy medium mm -hmm. it'll make life a lot mm -hmm. better sure excellent um next question i think war is one of the biggest challenges facing us environmentally in the sense that <clears throat> it seems that no country uh, will dare back down from this arms race and become an eco-friendly nation consuming less energy and such mm -hmm. uh, do you think we have any chance of becoming an eco-friendly world while nations still war with each other no one wants war. Nobody, nobody wants war in our world. And, and that's, 
that's obvious for, for all of us. But with fewer resources to share among more people, it's a painful reality that there is going to be more war. Mm. That there just is. Um, we'll be warring over things like water and food and space. I mean, there's only so much space. Here in Australia, people always say, well, you have so much room. We have so much room, you know, we have the, this giant land, it's the yeah. size of America, <laughs> you know. But a lot of our land isn't... Desert. It's desert. It's, we're not able to live there. And so there's, there is going to be wars over space, over this teeny tiny space that we have. Mm. And so it's, it's another thing where talking about the issue and trying to avoid war as mm. best as possible mm. because it is a big problem and, and no one wants it. So that's, that's another problem that there's no one solution. But if we can start thinking about population, that's what it all comes back to. And uh, do you think an energy population and economic descent has to mean going backwards and losing uh, modernity? Or do you think we can uh, degrow the current economic model and still evolve as a species and, and advance? Mm -hmm. Well, as a society, we will continue to evolve. That's just in our nature, to find better ways to do things to make survival easier. And so for all of us, I mean, we, we are trying the best we possibly can to live a wonderful life. And we're pretty lucky as humans. We, we don't have to worry about being eaten by a predator, <laughs> which is great. So therefore, we're able to advance a lot quicker. But we do have to start thinking about our impact on the planet, the footprints that we leave on planet Earth, because we're leaving these footprints for the next generations to come. So I, I think that we, we, need to, we need to definitely think about what, what we're doing on the planet, but it's not something where you can tell people that you're only allowed to have a bowl of rice now and you know, you're not allowed to drive your car. That, that's kind of hard to say that to a society. For us, I mean, that's what we've grown accustomed to, is driving in a car, flying in an aeroplane. Yeah. And so if you immediately took those things away, that would be difficult. Mm -hmm. But to start easing our way into a more sustainable um, lifestyle, that's what we need to start telling people, yeah. is put on a coat instead of turning on the heater. Walk to work, walk to school. So it's these little easy fixes that are really important because I don't think we're ever going to be able to take to tell this first world, these first world places, to change the way that they've lived their life for the last eighty years yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. It just won't work. So it's not like we should all be living the same way. That's not realistic. It's just finding a better way um, and finding a better lifestyle for both the planet and for yeah. ourselves. Because I think one of the things that often is thrown at environmentalists is that you know you want the world to go live back in the stone age sort of thing but it, it, it's not it it's just it's not gonna happen. yeah no it's not gonna happen we don't need to it's not about getting rid of technology it's about doing it in a, in a much smarter wiser I prefer to use, well, wiser, wiser yeah and you know I, I think that technology is terrific I mean it, it has connected the world and if it weren't for the computer mm. and the television I would have no idea how families are living in third world countries. Mm, right. If it wasn't for aeroplanes, I wouldn't be able to fly there and help. Mm. You know, and so there's cameras to help. <laughs> the cameras for bringing. Yeah. I mean, you guys yeah. are, are filming this yeah. and and are capturing this to spread the message. So, it's it's a, it can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's mm. kind of like playing with fire. Mm. You know, <laughs> we we need fire to cook, yeah. and it, you can get burnt. Yeah. So it's it's being wise and and kind of thinking about what you're doing and, and thinking about how it's going to affect the next generations mm -hmm. and using these tools as tools to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't overuse your car and, and, try and try and be smart about it. Try and be smart about it. So that's, that's, that's I think, what we should all remember and all take into consideration. And becoming more long. Less selfish, I guess. Yes. We're not so worried, you know. Generally, the current generation aren't really concerned about the future we're going to leave our kids because we're also selfish or consumed within our own sort of world, not thinking that far ahead. We accuse politicians not of not thinking that far ahead. But it seems yeah. you know, the general populace are, are the same as well. Isn't that funny though? How we're always there saying, "Oh, I wish 
the politicians would do this better or that better, I want to say to people, well, you can change the future. You're a person with a voice. You can walk around. You can you can pick up the phone and call someone. You, you have the opportunity to make a difference. We can't keep blaming others. Yeah. That, 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 that doesn't work. Yeah. So even if you were in politics in the government, you can't blame somebody else. Why not just fix it yourself? If you want to, work with the government. We do that. As conservationists, we will work with the government on issues. Mm -hmm. Just recently, we were trying to protect a piece of land called the Steve Owen Wildlife Reserve. Mm -hmm. And the Steve Owen Wildlife Reserve was first dedicated in memory of my dad yeah. just after we lost him. And it was dedicated to him uh, by the Queensland government for all of his, his efforts yeah. in regards to wildlife and conservation. And so we have protected this land. It, I've got to tell you, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has the highest, the Wenlock River, which borders the Steve Owen Wildlife mm -hmm. Reserve, has the highest biodiversity of freshwater fish in the country. Wow. We have found previously undescribed ecosystems on this reserve. We have had researchers from all over the planet yeah. come to the reserve to study. We've had malacologists, ichthyologists, paleontologists, all of these, you name an ist, and we've had them at the reserve, and uh, just studying, because it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, but we found out just a little while, like the day after we declared the reserve as our beautiful Steve Allen Wildlife Reserve, uh, we found out that it was under threat of being strip mined, which was really scary because these beautiful uh, bauxite perch springs yeah. um, were, were made from bauxite, yeah. which creates aluminium. aluminium or aluminum. I speak two languages. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really scary. So they were going to destroy these springs. And we said, well, we're not, we're not against mining. We're not against mining because we, we need mining. We do. But we don't want to mine everything, so can you just not mine this area? Um, no. <laughs> so they, yeah, we, we, yeah. So they decided that no, they were going to go ahead and mine. Yeah. And that was, do you want to wait for this plane? No. Oh, okay. No. Okay, okay. Fine. Just keep on no. going. We're not waiting for planes. <laughs> we got a message. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. Okay, so. so. Yeah. But th it was really scary, so we go, why, why do you have to mine this? I mean, it was set aside for Dad, and yeah. these springs have ecosystems that were previously undescribed, and it's, it's kind of disrespectful to the land. Yeah. Uh, and so we decided that, well, we're going to fight it. So we got over 400,000 petition signatures from people all around the world um, in, in support of protecting the reserve, and we worked with the government. So we worked with the government on ways to protect the reserve, bringing people and showing them and saying, this, this is why you need to protect this area. And so finally, a few days ago, that we were with the Premier of Queensland and uh, his team, and they officially announced the reserve protected after seven years of work, which probably was the best day of my life because we had been working so hard. It's like being at war, trying to protect this area from a mining company. And so we were overjoyed and thrilled. But that's what it takes. You have to work with the government. And if you have a problem, don't just stand by and blame somebody else. Stand up and fix it yourself. You, you have a voice. Go out there and change the future. So it's about encouraging individuals to take a stand. Yeah. yeah. We were really excited though. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we were so, so sort of happy. guaranteed that they can't. Yep, guaranteed that forever, Great. completely protected. Excellent. So we were amazed with all the science and everything yeah. that we did up there. It was terrific. Yeah. Really, you know, the really problem exciting. is, you know, the new government gets in and then they overturn. I know, and that's what we were worried about. We go, yeah. uh, is this going to happen? But they said, nope, it has the highest amount of protection as legislation will allow. Excellent. So, well, we're set. Protected forever, which is great. Yeah. Uh, two questions to go. Um, what role do you think things like uh, relocalization, community gardens, and permaculture have in teaching us how to transition into a low carbon, less consumptive world? Mm. Well, for a lot of people, we, we do want to change the world and, and we want to take care of our planet. And so there's a lot of ways of doing that. But for us as a family, we find that if you want to um, 
if you want to do a part, do your part to protect the planet, the single greatest thing that you can do for wildlife and wild places is to not purchase any wildlife products. That is so simple, but it affects so much. You'll never get the world to become vegetarian. That's just not yeah. possible. And the other thing is, it's wonderful if you are a vegetarian, terrific, good for you. But at the same, t same token, the area used to, to be you know, planting these crops is kind of, kind of the same as if you were having beef or cattle. And then the other thing is, is that beef and cattle, you know, beef, your, your cattle, your goats, pigs, chickens, they can be responsibly farmed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas our wildlife cannot. Sure. So we don't want people killing and consuming our crocodiles, kangaroos. I don't want to see snakes turned into boots, bags and belts. And I don't want to go to a restaurant and see that shark fin soup is on the menu. Sure. That's just really sad. So even because you can't really farm kangaroos, I know there's... No, you, you can't, can't farm kangaroos. kangaroos. And you know what? So the way they're killed apparently is not very nice. They have to shoot them still. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, a, we have a conservation property um, out in western Queensland. And they go out, there. they don't farm kangaroos. They go out and they shoot them. Mm, yeah. And often it's people who have had a lot to drink and they'll go out and shoot these kangaroos. Yeah. And on our property, because our property is beautiful, we put it aside for conservation. And this property is lovely and big, but when we go out, we often have to put down the kangaroos that we find on the side of the road mm. that have had their bottom jaws blown off. Yeah. They've been run over with their truck, with these guys' truck, and they, their backside is just mushed. Yeah. And they, they, they have to be put down because they're, gonna, they're going to die. They, they haven't been able to eat, mm. they haven't been able to drink, and they're dying. Mm. And you can't responsibly farm kangaroos. Think, they, hey. you, and people don't know that. No, but I think people, when they buy the kangaroo meat in the shops, they think they're being more eco-friendly or something. Oh, like, yes! Like eating an Australian indigenous animal. They think that if they, if they buy these products, these kangaroo products, and, and they, it's in their dog food or whatever, it's good for them. You know that um, in most kangaroo products, there's been traces of salmonella and E. coli in the kangaroo meat, and that's because they kill the roos and then they just string them to the back of their ute, and they're dead and just sitting there being high blown, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and it's disgusting as they drive into town to process them. They're not being taken to an abattoir; yeah. they're just killed, strung up in the back of the ute, and driven off. Mm. But we've been fed all of this false information, so we don't know that. Yeah. We've been there and we've seen it. So to be able to tell people, if you can do right by the environment and not purchase these wildlife products, to use our free range eggs or beef that has been responsibly farmed, that's doing right by the environment because it's not taking down all of these animals. But the other problem we have is with the black market as well. So for instance, tigers. Tigers are still being used for traditional medicine for their skins. Yeah, yeah. And it's an ongoing problem because people in these, in these little villages, they're trying to make enough money for their family. Right, so if it's possible and they're at the edge of a forest, they're gonna just go in and kill a tiger or something because it's easy to do and they get money for it. But the scary thing is, is that if you sell the tiger parts and let's say you get, this is just a random figure, let's say you get $50,000 for those tiger parts, and then you are prosecuted and taken to jail for killing that tiger, the next person that comes along will be offered $100,000 yeah. for those tiger parts because it's harder to get them and access them. So this is our ongoing problem. So really, we need to start telling people who are buying these products, sorry, but we're going to have to prosecute you because mm. it would stop like that. So if you, if you would not buy these wildlife products, you're doing a favor to the planet. And it's something that we can all do. So if you see crocodile on the menu, approach the manager, tell them why you can never shop there again, and then leave. It's as simple as that. And when the buying stops, the killing yeah, can totally. Like shark fin soup and things like that. Exactly, exactly. And it's getting the message out there. It's telling people that, you know, we have the ability to, to creatively cook beef and chicken. And if you are a clever chef, you will prepare a beautiful meal with lamb. If you are a 
uh, Lazy Chef, you'll use wildlife and exotic animals to try and spice up your, mi- your dish. So we're trying to tell people, just just don't purchase wildlife products. You're doing a favour to the earth. Yeah. Okay, final question. <laughs> um, I've heard you refer to the planet as Mother Earth. And uh, do you think, personally think, that the Earth is, is like life at the level of a whole planet, like, like mm. a Gaia? And, uh, um, and would such recognition of the Earth um, as, a, as a life form uh, be useful to mankind in the way we relate to and treat the planet? Well, I think that Earth is a little bit like a mother. I mean, this, this is our home, this is our planet, and it has taken care of us. I mean, we have fresh drinking water, we have food, all of these things right at our fingertips. But I think that it's also Mother Earth in regards to, like, a family. So if you are a mother of a really, really large family, then you're going to have a harder time giving the amount of attention and care to all of your kids as you would have if you had two kids. And that's the same with Mother Earth. She has a really large family, and so she's having a really hard time keeping up with all of these people and all of these animals, and it's slowly starting to to kill her. I mean, so so for me, Mother Earth, I think of it as my home, and this is, this is a beautiful planet. It really is. I mean, it's the only planet with life as we know. But we don't know of any other place in the universe that has life like this. And so we need to protect it and we need to take care of it. And for a lot of people, they don't agree with my opinions. They, they don't. They don't agree with my opinions on population, wildlife, all of that. But I believe that whether you agree or disagree with my opinions, at least we're talking about the issue. So that's why I'm really excited. And that's why I'm so happy to be talking to you. Because it's it's spreading this message to as many people as possible. And I've got to tell you, there have been people out there who have really criticized me for, for what I believe in. And yes, and you'll always you'll always get that. So to everyone out there, they, if you if you talk about these unpopular issues, you will be criticized. That's a part of it. Mm-hmm. But you have to be strong enough to say, well, that's your opinion. I'll let you have your opinion. And we've started to talk about the issue. Mm-hmm. So good for you. Good for you for talking to me about this issue. Because if we don't, no solution will be, will be made. Yeah. We won't come up with yeah. any solution. So I'm, I'm really, really excited. I'm excited to be working with such incredible people from all walks of life to start discussing this problem. And no matter what happens, I won't stop. I won't pack up my bags and say, that's it, I'm done. Because if you're truly passionate about an issue, it'll stay with you for life. It really will. So it's it's exciting and we're going to see some positive change, I'm sure. Yeah, we will. Definitely. Thank you so much. Cheers. That's wonderful. But good for you guys, really, because so many people are against the problem, you know? They're they're, they're just, no one wants to talk about it.